Hello, everyone, and welcome to this very timely program tonight. I'm Flora Davidson, Barnard Class of 1969 and current chair of Project Continuum. I consider myself a lifetime member of the Barnard community. I, a government major at Barnard, I earned a PhD in political science at Columbia and joined the Barnard Political Science Department in 1973. I retired as Professor Emerita of Political Science and Urban Studies in 2014. The mission of Project Continuum, which is the sponsor of the program tonight, um, it is a, it, the committee is a, is, is a committee, Project Continuum, excuse me, is a committee of the Alumni Association of Barnard College. And our mission is to bring together Barnard alumni who graduated 30 or more years ago in order to promote dialogue around diverse personal, professional, cultural, and political issues. Now, a housekeeping note for all of our attendees. You will not have microphone or camera access during this event. Attendees, voices, likenesses, and or images will not be captured by Barnard College. Written submissions of questions may be shared during the Q&A portion of the program. Feel free to submit your questions as you think of them in the Q&A feature on Zoom, and they hopefully will be answered during the Q&A time. I now have the distinct privilege of introducing Martin Stuta, who will moderate tonight's program. Martin Stuta is the Alina Wells Hirshhorn 58 and Martin Hirshhorn Professor of Environmental and Applied Sciences at Barnard College. He's also an adjunct senior research scientist at the Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. He received his PhD in physics from the University of Heidelberg. His research focuses on the reconstruction of past climate conditions from groundwater, global water resource issues, and the interface of water and energy, including gas production by hydraulic fracturing and CO2 sequestration. He served on the steering committee of the CARB Fix program in Iceland that successfully demonstrated for the first time in the field that, car, that CO2 can be turned into stone and successfully stored long-term in basalt formations. Martin, I now turn the program over to you and to our very distinguished panelists. Thank you, Flora, uh, for the very nice words. And welcome you all to this, uh, this very timely panel, as Flora pointed out. I mean, we all have seen a lot of evidence that climate change affects cities, urban environments. You know, just think about the more recent extreme weather events, hurricanes, heat waves, droughts, flooding. And there are many of our alumni actually very active in this field. And I just want to mention a few who maybe some of you are in the audience. Uh, on the science and engineering side, there's Sally Benson, who is actually a professor of energy resources engineering at Stanford, and one of the leaders in the field of uh, figuring out how to produce energy sustainably and how to get rid of CO2, which is the cause of a lot of the problem. There's Angela Wong, who is actually a climate resilience consultant, who has been working that field for 10 years with a special focus on, on urban environments. Uh, Annie Leonard is a, a former Barnard student who is the uh, you know, <clears throat> author of the very famous book, uh, The Story of Staff. And she also is the co-executive director of Greenpeace USA. And then finally, Polly Trottenberg, who um, was the commissioner of the New York City Department of Transportation um, and is now the deputy secretary at the US Department of Transportation. Just to name four uh, people that got their degrees at Barnard um, who are making really a difference in this field. And there are many, many more that I could mention. So I'm going to show you um, a, um, just a couple of slides very briefly that sort of motivate the issue. So let me go to slideshow mode. So why, um, okay, one second. Why do we care about urban environments so much? This slide gives you an idea how much 
how many people actually live in urban environments. So if you focus on the right side here, this is Northern America, uh, you see that from 1950 to 2020, we actually have increased the percentage of people in, the, in North America living in urban environments to 84%. And this is a global trend. Everywhere this percentage is increasing. So most people will be living in urban environments. Now, I, I like this, um, this next map that I'd like to show you, which is um, you know, an interesting diagram that shows population density, how many people live at a certain place. So like the higher the peaks there, the more people live at this location. And um, you see there are these enormous population cent centers in India and in China. Um, <clears throat> you see the rest of the world. Now, the interesting thing is that you can still realize all the coasts in this diagram. Um, you know, if you look at North America, for example, you see the Caribbean here, you see, see the coastlines, you see the borders of South America very clearly. And, and that gives you um, an indication that actually not only is the population in urban areas very high and increasing, but a lot of these urban areas are actually near the coast. That's why you don't need a map to actually show the coastlines in this map, because that's where people live. By the way, I find it interesting on the lower right, that's Australia that you see in New Zealand. You know, there's almost nobody living in Australia. Uh, but those few cities that are big <clears throat> are all on, along the coast. Um, now, that, of course, has one major effect on, um, on urban environments, if you consider climate change, and that is that sea level rise is one of the major results of climate change. And you see how that will affect in the future, the coastline of New York City. So you, you see the current coastline, if you focus on, on the Rockaways, for example, or Coney Island here in, in Brooklyn and Queens. Now, the, um, if you look at all the color coded areas, the red line actually would be corresponding to what we would expect in 2100 the coastline to be. Uh, so there is massive effects along these lines. And I want to show you one more slide, and that is, if you, if you look at where these coastline changes are most dramatic, you see the coasts here of Brooklyn and Queens, part of the Bronx. Now look at, at this map, which actually shows you the social vulnerability index for, for New York City. So where are the economically uh, disadvantaged uh, communities in New York City? And you see that they are overlapping to a large extent with those areas that are flooded the most. And this is a, a general point that I think we will make uh, later uh, in the panel discussion is that those populations, those communities are most affected by climate change. All right, so let me stop sharing uh, the slides and um, I'm going to um, go into the panel discussion. And my, my plan is to start to ask every panel member to answer the question, you know, what in terms of their research connects the most to the topic of climate change and urban environments today. So let me introduce everybody one by one, and then um, all panel mem members have two or three minutes to just explain, uh, focus on one aspect of their research. So our first panelist is Cynthia Rosenzweig. She's a senior research scientist at the NASA Goddard Institute, uh, Institute for Space Studies. She's also an adjunct senior research scientist at Columbia, Univers Columbia University Earth Institute. And she was a former professor in, at Barnard in the Department of Environmental Sciences. At NASA GIS, she heads the Climate Impact Group, whose mission is to investigate the interactions of climate, both variability and change on systems and sectors important to human well-being. She is co-director of the Urban Climate Change Research Network and co-editor of their assessment. Cynthia is a co-founder and co-leader of the Agricultural Model into Comparison and Improvement Program. And she was coordinating lead author of the Food Security Chapter for the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, Special Report on Climate Change and Land. And she's also the coordinating lead author on observed climate change impacts of the IPCC Working Group 2, the fourth assessment report. So Cynthia, tell us a little bit 
where does your work focus on in context of urban environments? And two or three minutes on, thank you. Yeah, okay, tell me, <laughs> tell me when to stop. Um, first, thank you, Flora. Thank you, Barnard alumni. Uh, thank you, Martin. It's wonderful to be here. I love Barnard. I love it. And I want, I don't want to be a former professor. I want to, I want to keep on being a professor in the department, uh, Martin. So we need to talk. So, um, uh, you know, all, well, you were saying some of the different things I've done, but one of the things that I think was not mentioned was that for 10 years, I was the with I was the uh, co chair of the New York City panel on climate change uh, with my colleague, uh, Bill Selecki uh, from um, from uh, Hunter Cuny. And that was bringing that was bringing the scientists from all around the metropolitan region, Barnard, Columbia, and, and others, right into the, to work with the government of New York City to help them prepare for the coming climate change. And not just coming, because it's already happening. And from that, uh, that New York, uh, it was originally uh, founded that that it's called the NPCC, New York City Panel on Climate Change, founded by uh, Mayor, uh, the then mayor at the time, Michael Bloomberg, and it has put that 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 bringing together the scientists, researchers, and the folks who were running the city, really has put New York City at the forefront of responding to climate change. So, uh, and then from there, we always said, well, it's not just New York City, it's global cities as well. It's all the cities have this very important role to play. They're the focus of economic activity. They're, they're responsible for up to 70% of greenhouse gas emissions and many located on the, the coast as we were just looking at in Martin's wonderful graphics they are on the front lines of the impacts of climate change too. So cities, and they are the they are the place where innovation occurs. So this leadership potential of cities is where what we really are focusing on uh, in our work with the Urban Climate Change Research Network and some of the other panel members are members of it and and authors of the assessment report on climate change in cities. It's like the IPCC reports, the big um, international reports from the UN. We do that for cities because of the important role that they play. So maybe that's a good place to stop for the kickoff, Martin. Thank you, uh, Cynthia. So our next panelist is Luis Ortiz, and I'm going to introduce him briefly. So um, Luis is a postdoctoral fellow with the Urban Systems Lab at the New School where his work centers on quantifying the interaction between the built environment and the atmosphere and how these interactions impact people and infrastructure in the context of a changing climate. His work leverages state-of-the-art climate models applied at the city scale to model the impacts of climate change on extreme heat and building energy use. Lewis' work has been featured in the 2019 New York City Panel on Climate Change report as well as in the upcoming IPCC Working Group 2 report chapters on cities, settlements, and key infrastructure. More recently, Lewis works on quantifying the impact of climate adaptation measures on New York City's energy costs, indoor heat exposure, and the environment. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you, Martin, for, for uh, having me in this panel. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, so, so as you're... Um, uh, the bio you mentioned uh, mentions a lot of my work uh, is, is in really quantifying how the way we build our cities uh, interacts with the with the air around it um, and how those interactions might change in the context of uh, a warming climate. Uh, so looking at how how much energy we use for cooling, um, uh, how much more exposed we are uh, to extreme heat, uh, both outdoors and indoors. And what can we do about that? And, and, and what are the implications of, of what we do to adapt to these changes? Uh, so a lot of my work has to do with uh, essentially taking those global climate models um, that the IPCC uses and, and essentially running very similar versions of those uh, just for cities, including a lot of the processes that are very exclusive to cities, um, such as the way buildings shadow each other, the way buildings store heat uh, and, and other processes like that. 
to get like a, a really um, detailed sense um, of how uh, end of century climate might look like in our cities and how and what we can do to to deal with that. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Luis. Uh, our third panelist is uh, Jeffrey Raven, and he is an associate professor and former director of the graduate program in urban and regional design at the New York Institute of Technology. He's a principal of his consulting firm Raven Architecture and Urban Design and co-chair of the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter planning urban design committee. He specializes in sustainable and resilient urban design and works to expand the agency of design by embedding climate science and design practice. Examples include a recent urban design climate plan in Durban, South Africa, the Mustar uh, carbon neutral development in Abu Dhabi, eco town prototypes in the Kolkata region in India, eco planning of provincial capital in Vietnam, smart growth planning in the New York region, lead building design in New York City, and the downtown Brooklyn plan. He has worked in numerous other countries and throughout the United States, and he contributes to developing sustainable resilient guidelines and metrics. Thank you for joining us. I want to thank you for having me. Can everybody hear me okay? Um, the genesis of a lot of my work has been through uh, practice, actually. And so I was. Uh, hear me okay? Uh, uh, It was very good before, uh, Jeffrey, when you had the headset in your ears that worked well. I'm getting an echo. Uh, Is it possible you have multiple devices on, so you may have to uh, disable the sound on one of them? I'm just going to go with the echo. Is this okay? Yes, it's okay for okay. us. All right. Sorry about that. If everybody can hear me, I apologize for that. Um, so uh, the work that I was doing as an architect, as a young kind of emerging architect in, in practice was around placemaking, which is actually fairly standard architectural practice, um, focusing on the uh, walkability, the, the, pub, the, the dynamic public realm that we aspire to in cities. Um, and having worked in uh, harsh uh, climates around the world, as was mentioned in the intro, um, actually uh, led me to explore some of the kind of vernacular or traditional types of urban design practices in these, uh, in these communities, such as uh, in a desert community, such as in uh, the uh, Persian Gulf region, uh, looking at the use of wind towers, thermal mass, um, self-shading uh, streets, that sort of thing. Uh, in the tropics, uh, the focus on um, uh, maximizing uh, district cooling uh, strategies. And that led me then to really kind of dig into what is the science behind it and how can we leverage uh, the uh, the, the work that, that's being done by many of my heroes who are actually climate scientists, including Cynthia, um, and uh, figuring out how to essentially um, uh, provide prototypes to test out the science uh, that uh, is uh, in great need of uh, actually being put into action. And so that's been really the thrust of uh, the work that I do. Uh, and we'll get into a little bit of that um, a little bit later in the program. Um, thank you, Jeffrey. <clears throat> so our final panelist uh, is uh, Sandra Goldmark. She's a designer, teacher, and entrepreneur 
uh, whose work focuses on circular economic solutions uh, to overconsumption and climate change. And she is an associate professor, professional practice, and director of campus sustainability and climate action at Barnard. Originally a, um, a, a <clears throat> the theoretical set designer, Sandra is the founder of Fix Up, a social enterprise that promotes repair, use, and the circular economy. She is a co-creator of the Sustainable Production Toolkit, a step-by-step -step guide to make theater productions more sustainable. She's also the author of Fixation, How to Have Stuff Without Breaking the Planet. Thank you, Sandra, for joining us. Hi, Martin, and hi, everyone. It's so nice to um, be here with you all. So uh, as Martin mentioned, I'm on the faculty at Barnard. My work is around design and circularity, but I'm, I'm more here tonight with my hat as the director of sustainability for the Barnard campus. Um, and the connection, I think Martin's question was, how does your work connect to this question of climate change in cities? Um, and in some ways, I think that uh, campus sustainability work is extremely exciting in the context of thinking about big cities because what you have on a campus is a little mini city. You have a microcosm of a, of a much larger system. And so one of the things that we've been able to do at Barnard and, and are committed to doing is understanding our climate response, our climate action program from a holistic systems-based perspective where we can analyze, for example, we can look at the large sources of emissions like some of uh, our buildings and our energy sources and also understand how they relate to other emission sources from food, from waste, from travel. We can use our campus um, because it's a campus is a much smaller, easier system to understand than a full entire city and begin to develop strategies that um, reduce emissions while also looking at how do we shift behavior? How do we build climate into our decision-making practices? How do we um, build it into our culture, into the student experience? Um, and especially at Barnard, how do we understand our work on climate as intersectional with our work on social justice? Um, global inequality and social justice are com so completely wrapped up in the problems of climate change that working at a community scale like Barnard can provide um, a, some really exciting pathways to thinking about the intersection of the two problems and the intersectionality of responses. So thank you all and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Sandra. So let me ask the first question and that is I will go around and ask all of you, what would you say are the trends in terms of climate change? change that we are seeing in the cities already? What are your projections for the future? And where do you see the greatest threat in terms of climate change, you know, in terms of urban environments? And let me start with Cynthia again, because Cynthia is sort of the climate scientist who really is at the foundation of all this and has looked at these trends in a lot of detail. Cynthia, go ahead. There we go. Um, okay, I think you are muted by accident, Cynthia. Can you unmute yourself? Yes. And you have to it start. Went over. back on again. <laughs> um, so I want to just share some of the findings from the latest Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. Um, this is all the scientists of the world, uh, climate scientists of the world, getting together about every seven years and studying every single uh, peer-reviewed journal article, every single indicator and monitoring um, uh, to be able to really say and share uh, with uh, the countries of the world, the people of the world, and the cities of the world um, what is uh, going on. So the first thing, the first point coming out of this recent report is that there is the highest degree of certainty ever about climate change. I'm going to read you the quote from the, from the, the combined scientists of the world. It is indisputable that human activities are causing climate change, making extreme climate events, including heat waves, heavy rainfall, and droughts more frequent and severe. And 
when th those are, this is a global summary, but when we look at the cities of the world and right down to, um, to write our city in the New York metropolitan region, we are seeing here, um, first of all, increase in warming um, uh, throughout uh, the year, uh, increases in heat waves, increases in heavy rainfall. Hey, right, what, what, my basement is flooded right this moment. Um, and, um, uh, and of course the high temperature effects that we're also seeing. So um, those, those um, climate extremes that we are um, seeing the increasing trends right here in New the New York metropolitan region are being seen globally as well. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, maybe Louis, you could go next. I mean, you are sort of interested in, in heat in cities very much and what kind of impact that has and that kind of tightly links in with what Cynthia was talking about. So where do you see the greatest threats? Um, I think, uh, and, and you presented a slide that kind of speaks to this a little bit on in your social vulnerability um, uh, index map. Uh, I think one of the, largest challenges is uh, both assessing who is getting most impacted uh, by, by the various hazards that um, uh, Cynthia mentioned are, are increasing in frequency and intensity, uh, like heat waves and extreme rainfall and all that. Um, and then not only that, but also looking at uh, how we adapt to these changes in an equitable manner, um, how we make investments in our cities um, that uh, protect the most vulnerable and not where some other indicator like most uh, monetary value, for example, uh, might be. Uh, and that has to a lot to do with uh, how we invest in retrofitting our buildings, uh, where we build parks uh, and, and have access to green space that provides uh, cooling to communities. Um, uh, and, and even uh, maybe maybe controversial, uh, who has access to to indoor cooling, uh, such as air conditioning, and and in, in lieu of that, where are the cooling centers uh, the city uh, sort of uh, puts out in the summer? Uh, so so viewing all these adaptations through an equity lens, I think is is probably one of the biggest challenges. Uh, and and many cities, including New York, are are sort of doing that to some extent. But I think it really needs to be uh, in the in the genetic code of everything that we do. Do you want to show that one slide that kind of makes some of your points? Um, sure, yeah, yeah, if, if you don't mind, slide six in your presentation, yeah. Um, so um, just to give some context, um, a, a lot of the work that I've been involved in uh, is in studying these adaptations and, and sort of the effect uh, that they have on the population uh, as they get adapted. And essentially, uh, what I'm showing here is the uh, cost burden of air conditioning adoptions uh, and, and, and looking at how some adaptations may have some, sort of an equity or, or envir environmental justice or, or even social justice aspect to them. Uh, and, and the idea here is that um, in, in very similar locations as Martin actually showed in his social vulnerability map, uh, we see those highest burdens uh, of, of cooling energy needs um, in, in those same neighborhoods, uh, for example, uh, parts of the South Bronx, parts of Brooklyn and Queens uh, that you see in those very dark red areas. Um, and not only that, but because uh, those, low in, those are very low income neighborhoods, uh, the climate signal has a bigger, bigger effect. So on the left, you see the present. On the right uh, map, you see the, the future sort of end, end of century equivalent. Um, and on the far right, you see uh, sort of the, the how with the change with income. So the lower the income, the higher the change, uh, essentially. Um, and and this, these are some of the challenges that we have uh, in, to deal with as we um, uh, start to look for ways to adapt to extreme heat. And that's just one example. Uh, there's, there's many other examples uh, in all, all sorts of different adaptations. So this is the kind of thing that I was talking about in, in, in all, uh, in, including that equity lens uh, in, 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 in the genetic code of everything that we do. Uh, because it's very easy to, to, to sort of forget about those aspects and, 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 and not direct investment towards the more so socially vulnerable populations in our cities. Could you just explain what the AC burden is? How that oh, is sure. Mm -hmm. sure. So it, it's essentially uh, the percentage of your income um, that is uh, spent to cool a, a square meter of a home. Um, 
So it, it's essentially based on, on very detailed climate simulations uh, and what we know about current costs of, of, of energy um, and, and, and how we build our city. So a lot of information about uh, the types of buildings that we have and, uh, and, and sort of the, the spatial uh, distribution of incomes and, and also the climate signal where, where it's getting warmer and, 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 and such. Um, so yeah, that's sort of like, it, it, it's essentially a, a measure of how burdened you are by air conditioning your apartment uh, during the summer. Thank you. So Jeffrey, you are working in the built environment. What kind of trends do you see there? How does climate change affect that? And what will the future bring along those lines? Well, Cynthia and uh, Luis set the table for us because uh, it's, uh, it's a very high bar and uh, you got to feel for the leaders who are going to COP26 in Glasgow about to sign a document uh, regarding the, um, their um, uh, attempts to meet uh, climate goals. And at the same time, they look, when, I always sort of have an image of them getting back on their airplane after signing and having a kind of celebratory session with champagne and then getting going back to their countries, flying over their countries and seeing what an incredibly challenging mess it is that they're looking down on in their cities because their cities are uh, uh, um, overlaid by uh, infrastructure, uh, mobility challenges, poverty issues, basic sanitary uh, needs, uh, population densities, etc. So how could we sort of uh, provide some sort of a uh, way forward in terms of sort of providing some action items, uh, ways of, uh, of actually uh, confronting these? And so like, for example, in New York, could we imagine a dense urban district that is further densifying because New York is densifying and many cities around the world are densifying because as we know, some of the key challenges of the world uh, facing uh, the globe is um, mass migration to cities. We know that. Uh, we also know about climate change and we know about the kind of uh, knock-on effects with respect to equity. So here you have cities around the world that are densifying and they're getting hotter at the same time and they're getting wetter at the same time. It seems very counterintuitive that everyone is going to be living in these kinds of environments. And so at the same time, the leaders are attempting to confront the climate challenges and sign greenhouse gas emissions goals uh, across energy, food, transportation, and embodied carbon. So the question that you know they're, they're challenged with in New York is, is certainly one of them, is what sort of city are we talking about here uh, for the future? Uh, how do we live in such a city? Uh, how would it function? And what would it look like? Uh, and so I think it's really a question of the sort of aspirational goals and mandates that you see in the city like New York, uh, which is really um, um, putting together some aggressive aspirational mandates with respect to uh, climate, but also uh, engaging the stakeholders and also leveraging the urban systems to achieve the kinds of outcomes that we're looking for. So those are the kind of big challenges. We can talk about some of the ways that we're trying to prototype with Cynthia and with, with other scientists as well, uh, some solutions. Thank you. Sandra, how would you see it from the Barnard College perspective? It's interesting. I think it's sort of this is sort of the part of the evening where we all share what keeps us up at night, I think, <laughs> and as we think about climate and cities. And I think I would um, echo what Luis and Jeffrey said about equity. How are we going to make this transition equitably um, and in a way that understands and acknowledges not just the disproportionate impacts of climate change, but also the way the root causes of climate change and the root causes of inequality are intertwined and how are we really going to do that work hand in hand? That's one big thing. And I think that that is the positive flip side of that is that a, a college campus is a great place to explore those kinds of big questions and those big overlaps. 
Um, uh, another thing uh, that keeps me up at night is how how Barnard or any institution of higher education is, is going to equip the next generation to deal with this. This is a wicked, wicked problem. And our job as educators is to make sure that our, our students leave our campus equipped to meet the challenges. Um, and this is such a big one. I think it's really a big part of our responsibility at Barnard to think about how we're doing that um, uh, for all students from all majors. And then the last, like, sorry, I don't know if we're allowed to have three worries, but it's climate change. You probably worry about three things. <laughs> My last big thing that I think about when I look at the, you know, I look at Barnard, it's a smaller system, but as I said, it's a microcosm of bigger systems. And I worry a lot about um, inertia, habit, you know, how are we going to at all levels of society from individual all the way up to the highest levels really make these changes at the pace and scale and depth that they need to happen. Um, when even in a place where there's the best of goodwill and intent, um, it's not easy to make these changes at any level. And so, and, and inertia and habit is so powerful. These organizations that we've built, they are built to run in a certain way. And what we're asking, what climate change is asking is demanding is that we change a lot, a lot of how we live in the world, a lot of how our, our cities operate. And so um, just the kind of psychological and organizational and systemic question of how we're gonna get those changes to happen equitably, quickly, and effectively. Thank you. Uh, before we move to the next question, I, I would like to encourage the audience to please submit questions. We will have time at the end where we will ask your questions uh, to the panel. And so please put them into the Q&A uh, window on your screen, and we will look at them in the last 10, 15 minutes of this panel. So we have two more questions to go over. <clears throat> you know, ours, my, my students tell me always, you know, you are always pointing out all the problems we are facing, the challenges. We want to hear about solutions. You know, this is uh, not the end of the story. Come on, help us uh, figuring something out. So that's the next question that I'd like to ask everybody. Um, what can we do about this as an urban community? What can we do it as an individuals and as students as well? So uh, maybe we'll break it up a little bit and so we let Louis start. What, what can we do about climate change in urban communities as a community, as individuals and as students? Hmm. Um, I think that um, a lot of the work that needs to be done um, starts in, at the very local level. Um, and, and by that, I mean local, um, uh, politics going down from community boards to uh, city councils and all the way up to the mayor's office, uh, which make or which have all this power to make decisions on how we use our land uh, in these sort of very small scales, um, all the way to, to how we can uh, make our buildings more efficient. We, in New York, we've had a few laws, right, that, that, that have tried to, to push buildings to be more efficient and, and more transparent in how they use their energy and their and their water in, in, in recent years. So, so I think as individuals, um, a lot of that has to do, a lot of what we can do has to do with how we get involved with these existing sort of political systems um, at the local level where we live, uh, regardless of where that is. Um, and, and, and always try to view um, the, the, all, all these investments or changes that are, that are being proposed and across all these community board meetings, uh, with the lens of climate change and the lens of equity and a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about today. Um, so I, I think that's probably one of the most um, uh, fruitful things that, that we can do as individuals. Um, and, and then as, as a community, and, and that can be as a community of, of, of students and, and, and at Barnard or at other institutions, um, organization uh, and, 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 and communicating with, uh, with a, a lot of the, uh, institutional leadership, right? And, and to help them uh, see that it's an important problem, right? And, you know, make investments uh, in, in, in green uh, uh, funds and stuff like that. Um, so I, I think these are the, the type of things that, that people can really get involved in, uh, regardless of, of any uh, major or, 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 or scientific background. Um, and it's probably one of the most important things anyone can do. Okay, uh, Jeffrey, you wanna go next? 
Yeah, sure. Uh, could you put slide eight up, mm -hmm. Martin? Thanks. Yes. Yeah. So um, the working with climate scientists, uh, we uh, tried to boil down um, the sort of principles of urban climate factors. Um, and I developed kind of four uh, fairly straightforward diagrams that uh, try to capture this. And they're broken into urban function and urban form. And so the top one on the left is really looking at the sort of anthropogenic uh, emissions, which are human caused emissions uh, based on human activity. What, you know, human choices, human lifestyle uh, through the city. Uh, everything from uh, the use of the automobile to um, actions that we take around transportation, you know, other kinds of transportation, industry, that kind of thing. Uh, even air conditioning use, uh, that sort of thing, waste heat. Um, and the other three are really around urban form and, you know, writ large. So you've got the form and layout of the, the district of a city, uh, what we call three-dimensional form or morphology of the, of the district. And that has uh, big implications with respect to urban heat island, for example, uh, because of the, um, the either the flow of uh, air through the district, uh, how you align the, the buildings in the district uh, to the uh, relationship to solar energy and or, or heat. Uh, and then um, materials is very important as well in number three, which is either you've maybe heard about albedo, which is you know reflective surfaces or surfaces that absorb heat. We know about dark surfaces like uh, asphalt, which uh, absorb quite a lot of heat in the city and al also have a knock-on effect with respect to permeability in storm uh, situations, which then is number four, which is about vegetative cover and not just about lawns, but also about tree canopy cover, things of that nature, which Luis is very, you know, I'm sure very familiar with and I know Cynthia is as well. So, um, so those are the kind of, uh, uh, kind of principles that I've been trying to work around through the work with uh, the practitioner community. Next, could you put the slide nine real quick? And so here you see, this gets to your question, Martin, with respect to uh, engaging different, uh, uh, not only stakeholder groups, but uh, participants in this uh, um, capacity building effort. Because essentially we're learning, uh, this is a fast evolving field and we're all learning, Age city agencies, practitioners, um, uh, community experts, uh, private sector, um, public-private partnerships, uh, net NGOs, those are all part, and students, of course. So we're all learning as we're going through this. And here's an example of um, a, uh, a charrette, a workshop that we did uh, a, a few years ago. Uh, and you see a, a colleague of Cynthia's and mine, uh, Christian Branion, who's at the head of the table from the Earth Institute, from GIS, uh, and myself working with uh, urban climate scientists on the left-hand side, and urban designers on the right-hand side and here of the table. And so here you have an exchange between these two different groups of experts finding commonalities in the kind of work that they do, the terms that they use, the tools that they use uh, to figure out ways of pushing the ball, uh, you know, uh, making progress uh, in, this, in this field. And so there's, it's really, so I guess I would encourage um, all of us to continually uh, develop sort of platforms for engagement and working together to find uh, common way, common solutions across sectors. Thank you. Um, a lot of New York City's infrastructure is quite old, right? So that's a particular challenge. How do we adapt to climate change? How do we make those things resilient and carbon neutral and so on? So maybe Sandra could talk a little bit about that because we have a challenge like that on the Barnard campus also. Yeah, this is, um, I'm gonna borrow a statistic from a colleague of mine named Dan Zarelli who I saw on a panel the other day and it was such a great statistic, Cynthia is smiling because she probably knows this, but he said on this panel that something like 90% of the buildings in New York 
are going to be here in 100 years. So the challenge for a city like New York in terms of our buildings is not thinking about what fabulous new buildings we're gonna build that are gonna be net zero or passive or wonderful in other ways. It's really dealing with the existing stock of buildings that we already have. And that of course, as Martin points out, is the exact situation on a small campus like Barnard where we are not gonna be building a lot of new buildings anytime soon. Um, but we do have coming down the pike a really exciting renovation of Barnard Science Center, Altschul Hall. And this is exciting for a number of reasons. First of all, our science uh, faculty and, and students will greatly benefit from having a wonderful, wonderfully renovated labs and places to do the, the work that we've been talking about tonight. It's also exciting to me because Altschul is a big energy hog on campus. It, it Not only is it an energy intensive building, it has labs, it's a big building, it's inefficient. It also supplies heating and cooling to other buildings on campus. So as we think about that renovation, we have a huge opportunity to really reduce emissions, um, our, our total emissions for the campus, which is super exciting. And then finally, from a design and architecture point of view, um, you all know I have a passion for circularity as a, as a key approach in so many fields to how we're going to tackle the climate challenge. When you think about the material impacts from, the, from buildings and from renovations, a renovation like Ultra, where we're going to maintain um, an existing, a very large percentage of the existing structure of the building, is a great opportunity, um, especially in an urban environment, to really think about design not uh, and um, and material impacts, not necessarily building from the ground up, but how we adjust, how we adapt, how we take what we have on our campus and in our cities and make it resilient and um, efficient. So that is an exciting thing coming down soon for Barnard. Thank you. Um, Cynthia, I know you have thought a lot about sea level rise, flooding, and what can, you know, and of course, New York City is near the coast and there's a lot of water in the city. Uh, where are we there? Is there hope that we can adapt to that, to rising sea levels and more massive storms? Yes. Well, certainly, and I, uh, some of the uh, great, great questions in the Q and A's are coming out. And uh, one of them was about coastal cities. And really, when we're thinking about um, the greatest challenge or, you know, the, what, what are the really big hazards for New York City? Uh, sea level rise and then exacerbated coastal flooding, regardless of what happens to storms, but also the more severe storms are, are uh, in, increasing and are projected to get worse. So, our coastal areas in our entire metropolitan region. And that was another great thing from the chat that it's important to take a metropolitan region approach, not just our five boroughs, um, uh, because we're really all in this together. So um, there are uh, many things that can be done along the coast. And after Hurricane Sandy, some of you may know that Dutch colleagues came over, right? They had originally colonized our region and then they came over to help us uh, respond after Hurricane Sandy and rebuild. And they, they conducted the, a, um, really a massive, uh, and it was uh, uh, funded by the federal government, uh, Obama administration called Rebuild by Design. And they then, they're just, so that there's um, many, many different parts, uh, uh, interventions, what I call, in what I call a portfolio approach, right? So it's not, there is no one silver bullet for any of this, but there are hard, um, there, there are hard structures, of course, you know, dikes and seawalls, things like that, berms, these big earthenware things. Um, but there are also social programs in regard to better, better insurance that is actually representing the risks, right? There's also uh, speaking to the communities in terms of um, looking to communities for better uh, taking care of of na elderly neighbors who maybe aren't able to, to uh, respond. So, uh, and the use of faith-based our, and by the way, also we held, after Hurricane Sandy, we had colleagues from Bangladesh come and share theirs, their, their um, knowledge. But we do have to, and I put it in the chat, 
that a very hot topic now for coastal resilience is sometimes it's called uh, managed retreat, but we're New Yorkers. We don't want to retreat from anything. <laughs> so um, I feel that we need to, um, uh, I use the term instead strategic relocation so that there are communities, there were buyouts right after Sandy funded by New York State. Uh, for example, on um, uh, on Staten Island, in which all communities really did pick up and leave, and and in some cases, that may be the the most appropriate thing to do. But I want to say one more thing about adaptation in general, and I think all of the all of the comments from from the my fellow the fellow panelists are really showing. It's called, and we came up with this term. We kind of we stole it from London, actually, in NPCC. The first one actually, and it's called flexible adaptation pathways. So the idea, and this, this comes back very much to Barnard being a center of learning, right? So we can't, we're not gonna solve everything in these one-off interventions. We, what we need to be thinking about is we're gonna try things, see what works, then learn, then do a better job, right? And you know, and you know, some of the lessons are, I think, heartbreaking. For example, the basement flooding in the recent hurricane. We've got to do better. We have. It's just absolutely essential. But you see, it's like, okay, that happened. We now we've got to pour. We've got to take. We've got to learn better. What can we do? And that's not. That's the. And those interventions are so right. So for the, for for those communities are related to all the things that we've been talking about, the social part of it, um, uh, equity issues, um, immigration, um, as well as the, uh, the building and design. So um, all these things, but this idea of that, that adaptation is a process. We're going to be learning and responding to, these to the changing climate for the coming decades. And, and having that uh, learning and flexibility that we can learn from from mistakes and uh, and then um, and then keep doing a better and better job. Thank you. Um, huge challenges ahead. If you know, we just we are still in a big crisis related to COVID, obviously. And one could argue that climate change is a much bigger challenge that we are facing. I don't know if everybody agrees on that, but that would be my opinion. And we haven't done very well with COVID. With climate change, we are under a lot of pressure to very quickly do something. So the question is, how do we get there? You know, how do we make it happen? You know, and the whole re the response to COVID globally is not too encouraging along these lines. Uh, so what do you think are the best strategies uh, to actually do something? Is it, is it on the technical side, the challenge? Is it on the political side, implementation? Where do you see most of the challenges and which way should we go? That's my last question. And then we go to the Q&A. Um, I don't know who wants to chime in. While you're still thinking, I know Flora would say, vote okay that's very important there are different opinions out there in the political realm so make yourself heard right so i'm just chiming in you for flora uh, but what do others think <clears throat> well this is a very hard question you can tell because we're all sort of like <laughs> Biting our nails and and uh, and super stressed out, but it's it needs to be asked. So thank you, Martin. <laughs> I guess I will just say one part of it that I see from from working at Barnard, from working at the smaller microcosm of the bigger systems, is I see a need. I don't think right now the real gap is on the technical side. There are some gaps on the technical side, certainly across the spectrum, but largely, I think we know. Uh, what to, if not what to do, at least as Cynthia says, what to try and then to iterate from there. Um, and the question seems to be to get the political will and the social will to make it happen. And so I feel like somehow 
we all need to be empowered to take on this work. Luis used the term lens earlier, talking about bringing an equity lens to this work. And I think we all need to bring, literally wherever we work, whatever field you work in, you don't have to be a climate person, we need to bring a climate and equity lens to our decision-making processes. Um, now that is easier said than done, but I think that is for me a big key um, to the path to hopefully getting there. Maybe I'll jump in to say, again, this uh, echoes Sandra and what I was saying before about this pathway that, that along with that, I think we have to establish long-term relationships. I think that we, as a society, maybe also in cities, but I think just this, this sort of, there's all this, I think we're coming out of, a, and I think we have to use the COVID recovery coming out of COVID to change things and use it as an impetus. Because I, I think that a lot of our society is just like one off. Oh, that's a great project. Like we're gonna do that. And then we're gonna, oh, now let's go do something else. Sometimes they call it change the channel. Uh, this is like for research funding. It's like, okay, we did that. We're changing the channel, right? Whereas really the problems are so enormous as we've been hearing from everyone and, and embedded with the equity issues and the climate issues and their, their intersection that we've, we, how, we're not going to solve this unless we, unless I love the picture that Jeffrey showed of the, um, of bringing the people together. And those workshops that USERN, um, our network does, they, they're called Urban Design Climate Workshops. They are ongoing. We don't helicopter into a city and then, you know, get it all powered up and then, you know, fired up and leave, right? Jeffrey, you've gone back to, to Durban, right? You're going Going back to Paris um, in a few weeks. So I think it's relationship building so that the also between the scholars and the folks who run the government, right? There's we have there's an issue because of the um, um, our democratic uh, way of government here in the US, right? A new election, it's a whole new team. Then they have to recreate everything all over again. And then, you know, and then there's, there. for example, there has been hiatus periods when in which the New York City panel on climate change was basically on hold, right? But we can't really afford that anymore. So I think creating mechanisms by which long-term relationships, long-term learning, uh, can be, and by the way, it's not just adaptation pathways, it's mitigation and adaptation pathways now. So that's what I would say. I love that, Cynthia. Community. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree more with what was said. Um, if you could show that, just that last slide real quick, uh, Martin, um, in, my, in my stack, um, it just shows a a kind of the way that we've been working with communities. Cynthia mentioned the urban design climate workshops. Uh, and so we've been developing these scenario uh, 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 designs for, yeah, that one, um, where we have a current uh, scenario, a 2050 business as usual scenario and a 2050 say best practice scenario, which essentially is based on these climate factors that I showed earlier. And there you're really, as Cynthia said, we're really looking at uh, the integration of climate adaptation and climate mitigation together. And so through Urban Heat Island, and this happens to be a, a project in New York, uh, but as Cynthia said, you know, we're going back to Paris uh, in November, uh, working with a very big coalition of uh, research um, institutes there. And we've been working in, uh, in Durban as well. So the, the, the question then is, uh, you know, and one of the one of the chat uh, questions is, you know, what what would you suggest that the city does now? And I think it's really important to lay out. Um, uh, um, we're a private, you know, we're a private sector driven uh, economy, and so what are the kinds of tools at our disposal to uh, drive uh, this kind of uh, transformation? I think the campus. Um, you can you can turn turn off that uh, uh, slide, but I think the campus uh, uh, scenario that Sandra is bringing up is really a very interesting prototype that can actually be 
uh, we can learn from with respect to governance structures at the dis district level, for example, overlay districts uh, having to do with um, low carbon emissions. Uh, the campus has a very unique opportunity to sort of look at uh, energy transfer within the campus, um, uh, behavioral incentives and that sort of thing. Some of those could be transferred into neighborhoods uh, with the appropriate sort of governing structure uh, in place. And so we're looking at things like uh, transfer development rights, um, overlays like similar to build, uh, business improvement districts um, and those kinds of uh, tools, um, which I think could be leveraged uh, quite effectively. Also, short, medium and long-term uh, strategies. Short term can be everything from just simply changing the, al the albedo uh, surfaces on the rooftops to make them more reflective, very simple, uh, to medium, which is actually a stroke of a pen uh, in legislation, which actually the city council can certainly uh, put, put forward and has, which is going to have domino effect in terms of purchasing at the city level, those kinds of things. So those can move the markets. Longer term, you're looking at really larger scale um, linear corridors, for example, for, for uh, green infrastructure, passive cooling, a transfer of energy, energy transfer within districts, micro districting, those kinds of things. And I think that that's really, uh, um, you know, what's promising, uh, you know, in terms of the kinds of strategies that we're looking for. But for example, just in terms of uh, regulatory, the regulatory world, right? There's, um, we have an environmental assessment and review in, in New York City, environmental impact statements. Well, why not have urban heat island in the chapter on public health? Uh, that is not currently there, uh, but could certainly be one of the factors for approving uh, certain uh, high density um, uh, developments. So those are the kinds of, uh, elements that um, you know we could bring to the table. Uh, Luis, you also wanted to chime in or should we go to questions? Um, no, I, I, I wanted to also pick up on a point uh, that several of the panelists brought up earlier um, uh, about how the COVID and using the COVID crisis to, to sort of as a, as a learning experience to what how we need to act uh, to with the climate crisis, right? Um, and, and something we also, I feel, learned uh, or, or have been trying to learn is, is the fact that many of these hazards can happen uh, at the same time in, or in, in overlapping in space. Um, so that, 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 that's something that um, ha, has been occupying a lot of my uh, brain space in the past uh, year, uh, how, how we deal with these overlapping hazards. Uh, for example, if, if the winds from the nor'easter tonight knock out the power, uh, I mean, if it were to happen in, in August, right, and it was a heat wave or a hot day the next day, uh, how, how, what kind of effect would that have? Or we have COVID and suddenly your cooling centers are not as effective because you can't cram as many people in them. Uh, so that, that's, that's the kind of thing that I, I, I feel the, the, the policymakers and, 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 uh, and other stakeholders need to really start looking at very intently these sort of overlapping hazards. All right, thank you. So let, let's maybe try to answer some questions. I know some of the panelists have done it already in the Q&A box, responded directly to some of the questions, but there are still quite a few open ones. You know, I think a lot of, there are several that ask for more concrete examples of what could be done, right? Or what would be the law that should be implemented in New York City tomorrow? Uh, could we contemplate stopping the use of concrete and steel is that an option to move forward? What do we do about those communities that are mostly affected, the people living in basement apartments? So do you have any more sort of really concrete steps uh, that we could take and should take soon? Yeah, I mean, I think in the construction, I mean, uh, Sandra knows this, uh, I'm sure quite well, where you're, you're looking at procurement of, uh, of construction materials for campus uh, construction. I mean, there, there's really a lot of work being done around timber construction, for example. So there you've got, uh, uh, you know, the, the opportunity to uh, use 
other materials than concrete and steel. But I mean, concrete also can have uh, really uh, significant additives uh, that can reduce the carbon content of the concrete and steel can be recycled uh, heavily. So, you know, those play a major role in terms of reducing the carbon footprint of really the substructure of our buildings. And then for the superstructure of our buildings, there's really, uh, there's a lot that can be done there in terms of um, even some uh, disruptive uh, uh, techniques such as uh, um, phase changing materials, for example, which, uh, which can have a, which are, are lightweight construction, but actually have quite a lot of thermal mass so that you can actually absorb quite a lot of heat uh, within the envelope of the building, uh, which typically a lightweight construction doesn't do such a good job on. So, I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot there in terms of the uh, materials, but it's a great question because the embodied energy is a huge, huge topic that oftentimes when cities, and be, be very, audience members out there, be very skeptical when you hear a city is uh, carbon neutral or a district is carbon neutral, how do they de define the boundary levels of that carbon neutrality? That's a big question. Is it scope one, scope two, scope three? Is it embodied carbon? Is it material flows, food? I mean, it's complicated. A lot of, a lot of complicated uh, urban systems. Um, there was also a question about divestment, you know, that it's, um faces some challenges. And I know that uh, Sandra, you have worked on divestment at Barnard quite a bit. I don't know if you could comment on that, on that question. It's often, the question is it's often undercut by hedge funds um, and um, it's very hard to make a difference. I guess that's what the comment says. And I think at Barnard, there has been some movement in this direction and what challenges did Barnard face along those lines? Yeah, I oh, thank you. I just found the that comment about divestment. I hadn't seen that, but um, the art, it's interesting. The article Judy is referencing about the um, private equity funds scooping up the the mm -hmm. fossil fuel stocks is interesting. There's also just today I just saw a Bill McKibben article about the divestment movement. It's interesting to read those two together. Um, uh, Bill McKibben's article pointing out some of the successes of the movement, and that New York Times article about the private equity pointing out some of the challenges. But it, um, I agree that for me, for me, divestment or looking very uh, thoughtfully and intentionally at your financial management has to be part of the package. Because as I said, I think we need a 360 degree approach. So if you're looking at your operations, if you're a campus, you're looking at your education. And I think you have to look at your financial management. Um, again, I think every department in any organization has a role to play. What Barnard has done in terms of divestment was um, develop a climate science list with fossil free uh, index and the union of concerned scientists where we evaluated um, 30 uh, oil and gas companies and rated them and the board committed to divest from uh, they in June of 2020 they divested they drew a line depending on the scores um, and divested uh, from fossil fuel deniers companies that deny or thwart climate science and the logic for Barnard's approach was that um, taking, uh, differentiating between the fossil fuel companies was important in terms of not just divesting, but also sending a market signal to say that um, these bad actors have been consciously um, uh, promoting poor science or, or misleading facts and that that goes against Barnard's academic mission and that it's important to send a signal about um, what the role of fossil fuels company, companies might play in the future and how um, divestment can play a role in, in sending a signal. There's also a question about air conditioning. I guess it's a fair statement that air conditioning will have to increase. I mean, even in Europe where there is no, almost no air conditioning, in 20 years, we probably will have air conditioning. In very poor countries, that's a huge challenge. These things are expensive and they consume a lot of energy. 
Are there alternative approaches to that? Or how do we deal with this huge demand on air conditioning in the future? I don't know, Louis, do you have this an answer? Louis. <laughs> but but I, I'm happy to jump on uh, after Louis talks. Okay. <clears throat> um, no, I, I agree. It's, it's a tough problem because air conditioning, um, well, in two ways, it's a tough problem, right? It's air conditioning uh, is, is, can be a, an economic burden, like I mentioned earlier, uh, but it's also an environmental burden, right? And it's, it's what we call a positive feedback. So uh, the more we use, the more uh, excess heat we're, we're, we're putting into the air. So it's, it's, a, it, it's, it's certainly a big problem. And, and, and not only that, there was uh, recently a study based in Paris uh, that found that even with a whole suite of um, uh, other adaptations that range from uh, like, like what Jeffrey mentioned, um, uh, uh, reflective roofs, uh, green roofs and additional green space and then other types of, uh, of uh, efficiency measures on buildings, uh, end of century climate change is still projected to, to necessitate the use of air conditioning uh, in, in a city like Paris, which uh, in many ways has a, has a similar climate to, to New York. Um, but I do see many opportunities in, 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 in developing countries though, because they're still building out their building stock. They're not stuck with their, you know, hundred year old, you know, brick buildings that we have here. Uh, so so there, there's, a, there's a way to, to change that paradigm of building to, to use lighter materials, passive cooling, to mitigate some of that use of air conditioning uh, and, 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 and sort of rid yourself of some uh, of the excess heat and excess um, carbon emissions related to the energy use and, and economic burden. Uh, so there are opportunities, um, but as, as things get warmer, it might be the case that in some places it might be a, an evil we have to live with. Um, and it's, 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 it's a shame, but it's, it's, a, it's sort of a unavoidable to some extent. Yeah. I, think, I think the challenge, uh, and, I agree, and I agree with uh, Luis, what he's saying about you know, unavoidable in some cases, the challenge is not so much about peak peak loads in August. Uh, you know, yes, most cities are going to be hot in August uh, or in July. The question is, how do you ensure that uh, air conditioning is not required in May? Uh, and that has a huge knock-on effect with respect to energy use and also waste heat. Uh, within the city. And so, you know, when we worked in, in the Middle East, you know, when I, you know, we we're working in a very hostile desert environment, we were um, uh, tr trying to create, you know, we, we're looking at the district as a microclimate. And so you essentially have these comfortable oases, a string of them linked together by vegetative cover or self shading streets which are essentially comfortable enough to use without mechanical cooling for let's say nine months out of the year, as opposed to six months out of the year. And I think that's where, you know, the Paris's of this world and the New York's of this world and other cities like that are, are operating. It's that uh, to, to the extent that we can shave off certain numbers of months in a year that is required. And I'm not talking about today, I'm talking about 2050, say. And I think that that's, that's and, and part of it also has to do with building design. And so, you know, having shallow floor plates, for example, in our buildings would allow for more cross ventilation, you know, due to dual aspect uh, windows, for example, on both sides, um, those kinds of things. And I mentioned about thermal mass and things of that nature. So microclimates at a district level is a major, major topic. And it's not something that city regulations really look at. They look at the building uh, specifically, but they don't look at the district. And that's where I think really, you know, with Cynthia and others, that's really where we're putting most of our uh, research. Can I just hop, on, hop in and say, this is why it's so important to reduce greenhouse gas emissions so we don't get the highest temperatures that are projected. Right. It's, and it shows, it shows why you have to be looking at mitigation and adaptation in an integrated way in, in cities because it's so completely intertwined. But anyway, Martin, can, can I do my optimism versus pessimism slide? Sure. <laughs> uh, and then we have so, to 
uh, come to an end. People ask me, this is, this is my FAQ. <laughs> what are you, you know, why do you seem so optimistic about climate change? And there's so many articles now about going into the conference of the parties. Um, and um, I wanna make a comment about that, about the, con the conference of the parties. Um, but um, the first is that for, I think for, the, for this time, uh, the need for urgency is finally upon us after the horrendous climate extremes across the world uh, that happened um, over the past year. Um, so that uh, not only the droughts and the uh, f uh, fires in California, but floods in China, floods in Germany, um, uh, just tremendous, it's no longer climate changes in the future. It's the realization that it's now. So the, the sense of urgency, I think, is greater than it has ever been. Um, the second is that this COP in 26, there are a lot of articles about how it's not, it's gonna not work, it's gonna be a fiasco. But it this is the P and the, it stands for the parties, which is the countries. And so I think it's important that it gives the countries an opportunity for, and this is the quote in the negotiations of increasing ambition, right? Because right now everybody knows that they've only pledged to, and it's only a seventh of what is needed. Um, but again, think about this in the long term, as I'm saying, just as we needed the flexible adaptation pathways, we need flexible mitigation pathways, right? We, you know, we don't really know yet exactly how it's going to happen. But this idea of increasing ambition over time is, I think, and that it's a process, I think it's very important to, uh, to remember. Another reason I think to be, um, uh, more sanguine um, about the process is that the United States has come back to the negotiations. Um, and um, in climate change, new, um, US, United States it has, has been and has a special role to play as a leader. And they are very, they're, they're bringing the, the, I just learned today, they're the biggest, um, a delegation is coming from the United States to the Conference of the Parties. Um, and then, but, but you see the parties are only the countries and the role of the cities, and this is what I wanna end here. The, uh, the cities are the sites for the innovations. So if it's programs to help the people in the basements, concrete social programs to help the people who are there. So that was a great chat question. You know, so designing programs that combine for the social for the for the social programs that combine with then um, the regulations for uh, and the follow ups, right? Uh, I think that what were the, what are the most vulnerable areas and um, uh, really targeted interventions is what is clearly needed across social and then physical and building, et cetera. Uh, all of that together. But this is where cities are where these vital innovations, also the you know concrete and steel, the building materials, the designs for the air conditioning, the uh, you know the use of renewable energy for the electrification, um, the public transportation. It's so every single thing is there for cities to be the sites of the vital innovations. And this is happening not just here in New York City, but through the case study docking station of the assessment report. Uh, uh, maybe we'll, we'll follow up with that. That is uh, concrete examples of what cities are doing around the world of testing those, um, uh, of testing the innovations. So um, I feel that with putting all of these things together, there is a, a case for optimism and not just pessimism around climate change. Okay, thank you, Cynthia. That's a very good place to end maybe this uh, panel discussion. We realize we can only scratch the surface in this discussion. It's a huge topic. Every little topic we talked about is probably the subject, could be the subject of five PhD theses, as Jeffrey said the other day. So, um, it's a, a huge challenge, but you know, 
let's try to be optimistic because otherwise we won't be able to master this challenge at all. And I'll hand it off to Flora for some closing words. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. There we go. Am I back? All right. Good. Hi, everyone. Uh, wow, I am so gratified by this, this incredible discussion that you've had. And I want to thank each and every one of you uh, for your incredibly wonderful contributions um, and your insights and, and also your generosity with your time tonight. I was particularly impressed by several factors, one which really relate to my own areas of, um, of expertise. One is interdisciplinarity. Um, you can't do this without interdisciplinarity and the emphasis on collaboration between scientists and practitioners. Um, another really important point, um, the clear need for political and public buy-in. Um, and I, I really appreciated Cynthia's uh, optimistic assessment at the end there on that, um, as well as constant attention uh, to equity. Uh, Martin, you've really put together a fabulous panel. Um, I think we covered an enormous amount in a very short period of time. And I wanna thank you all. And before we go, uh, I'd like to remind everyone that we are in the midst of the Barnard Year of Science, which is a year long celebration of all things <clears throat> STEM at the college. STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics. Um, through world-class research programs and robust curriculum, Barnard is creating a new generation of women leaders in STEM. Uh, during the year of science, the entire college community is coming together to showcase their incredible work. And we hope you will continue to be a part of it. To learn more about Barnard's eminence in science and what our faculty, students, and alumni are working on, and to get the details about upcoming events, please visit yearofscience.barnard.edu. And thank you each for being part of this. Thank you to the audience for uh, your questions and your attention. Um, and please remember to take care of yourselves and each other. And don't forget to vote. Uh, good night, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>